So I'll go on record here, right? I didn't fully respect how much of a like futuristic person Dennis Rodman was. You might want to put on your seatbelt. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's part of these car ride things. <laughs> is uh, safety, safety first. first. On today's car ride confession, we have um, one of my friends. I've really been looking forward to do this interview with you, Mitch. Everyone, this is my friend Mitch Williams. I met Mitch because his older brother and I went to the same university and yeah man I would love we can probably just kind of unpack the story as it goes yeah um, awesome well I'm excited I'm a big Jerry Seinfeld fan so I feel like this is the closest I'll ever come to comedians and cars getting coffee um, but yeah so I have been a church planner for about uh, I guess close to two and a half three years now and uh, me and my wife live in Greenville. We have uh, one pet, a golden doodle. Um, That's who awesome. Is, who's a great pet, but no kids yet. So, uh, who are your sports teams that you pull for? Um, so I love watching all sports, but like if there's one team that I'm gonna get very invested with is Duke Blue Devils basketball. I'm a huge coach. Really? K. Yeah. Never in a million years yeah. would I would have guessed that sport yeah. or that team. Yeah. I love football. I love college football, but like I can't get in the whole Clemson Carolina rivalry because I just, I, you know, Duke's terrible at football. I, you know, I cheered for Carolina for a while, uh, South Carolina, because I had a friend that uh, played there, but. Other than that, I just enjoy a good football Saturday. Have you ever seen one of their basketball games in person? Yes, I've actually been to two Duke uh, basketball games. They weren't play well. Actually, one was when they were playing Indiana, and it was insane. Um, but yeah, it's I mean, Cameron Indoor is such a small arena, and when you're there, it is quite an experience. It's would, awesome. you, would you flip out if they called you and said we need you to be our team's chaplain? Oh my word. I would literally be in heaven. I'd be cloud nine. I'd be like, whatever you need me to teach or say, I'll do it. I'll be a puppet <laughs> to, to be able to have this experience. That's right. Uh, if you could be any athlete, book character, or movie character, who would you be? So amidst all of the Star Wars, Marvel, Lord of the Rings, oh, Benjamin man. Button. Yeah, Benjamin Button is not a bad one. Um, pretty much any role that Matthew McConaughey has ever played. Um, I really love his character in Mud. Uh, it's just, I don't think I've seen that. He's just eccentric and weird, and he lives in a boat treehouse, which is kind of like a, a dream of mine to have a boat treehouse. But no, pretty much, uh, if I could be an athlete, you know, I've actually thought about this. I think about a lot of weird things, but athlete-wise, I'd want to be an athlete where when I turn 70, my body wouldn't be in terrible shape. So. You know, doing something like baseball wouldn't be bad, but... Golfers, dude. Those guys yeah. age really well. Yeah, I, except for Tiger Woods. That's but true. part of that is, you know, if you get hit over the head with a 9-iron, you're going to face consequences. So, um, yeah, I'd probably... I, I would love to I'd love to play football or basketball, but I think I'd rather be a movie, a movie star. But Desert Island movies would... Oh, man, that is so hard. I, this is like a hot take, but there's a Will Ferrell movie called Kicking and Screaming which is actually family friendly. I, not all these will be family friendly, sure. but uh, that is hilarious. It's like what I would be if I coached a little league soccer team. <laughs> that's like, that's exactly what my life would look like. Um, I would probably have to put uh, Billy Madison in Ooh, there. Sure. Just cause like old Sandler is so funny to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Shampoo, conditioner. Oh my God. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, and I'd have to have probably either like a Step Brothers or uh, or something along the Anchorman. Somewhere in there would be my, would probably be my third. So kind of some variance in it. If you could do dinner with anyone in all of history, it was an hour uninterrupted. Of course, assuming that like all of our first pick would be Jesus, right? But my second pick, right? <laughs> uh, I would love to, uh, to have dinner with someone that was a, I would consider like a disruptor. I would love to have like dinner with Jobs, Steve Jobs, or um, or Ed Catmull at, at Pixar. Uh, I just think uh, someone like that that really fought, fought so much of what was the expected, this is what it looks like. I think it'd be fascinating to kind of see how intellectually they dealt with a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, or someone like, a, you know, Alexander the Great, or a, I love G.K. Chesterton. He mm. would be up there, I, although I would have trouble understanding everything he's saying because he's so brilliant. But mm. um, 
or man, I know. I can I change? My, I'm going to change my answer to C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Because I love the way that Lewis thought and wrote, and the way that he like allows you to fall in love with God. Is I, it's just like I want to be able to teach that way. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'd probably go Lewis as my uh, revised answer. What are your favorite apps that you use almost all the time? What are the podcasts you're listening to when it comes to your phone device? What are the things that you're frequenting most? Yeah. Um, so apps, I'm, you know, I'm part of like the non, I'm, I'm a millennial, but like not necessarily the most technologically savvy millennial. So I, I'm, I'm of the Twitter generation and everybody hates Twitter that's not from that generation, but I enjoy uh, Twitter simply because I can like follow sports and things that I'm actually interested in without, you know, Facebook and everyone, you know, giving constant, you know, posting articles that aren't true. Um, I'm on Instagram a good bit. Uh, I, I have Audible, so I, I use Audible a lot. Um, but right now, normally the ESPN app would be pretty heavily uh, used, but with no sports happening, that's not really reality right now. But um, how, how much are you loving the Michael Jordan Oh my word! On oh my word! Like, I I had no idea. I you know I always like what I was so young when it was all happening that like I didn't fully respect how much of a like futuristic person Dennis Rodman was Dude, at absolutely. the time. I'm like absolutely. everyone is wearing these baggy suits and dressing yeah. terribly, and he's like wearing this weird stuff that actually would be cool now. It's sure. like, uh, but no, I think it's amazing. I think. Uh, it's also like there's a part of it that makes me sad because it seems like he still just can't say right. nice things about people because he's right. still so competitive. Right. Give me the secrets of time management in your life. Um, insomnia. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it looks like insomnia. How do you at sleep? Time. Do you sleep well? I do not sleep well. I my like sweet spot is like six hours a night. If I get six hours, I'm great. I normally will fall asleep about two. Where'd you go to seminary? I went to Southeastern and uh, got my MDiv there. Uh, did it all through distance learning, but um, got it done in three years, which was an absolute beast of a of a mm. task to say the least. So a lot, lot, lot of all-nighters has kind of ruined a lot of my sleep patterns um, and the stress. I, I say I'm still a church planner because I feel like it gives me some grace of like if I do the wrong thing. I mean, yeah. like, well, I'm just a church planner. You know how we There's are. There's a lot of rope on the end of yeah, that yeah. title. <laughs> Who would you say are the greatest communicators alive today, both in ministry and marketplace? Yeah, in ministry, I think it's hard to think of anyone better than Andy Stanley. Absolutely. From a simply just clarity, yeah. and you see this even in like jobs, like jobs never used words over a fifth grade level of just being so clear and so concise with how he delivers things. Uh, I feel like Andy Stanley is like the ultimate. He's not necessarily like the style I prefer because like I'm a you know high energy person. I want someone to be you know get me excited and charge me up. But as far right. as like craft goes, um, he's got to be up there um, as as the top in the street world um man it's hard to say as far as in the marketplace you know a guy that i have been influenced very highly by is a guy named carmine gallo who uh he does, did a lot of work with like the science behind ted talks um and i think that a lot of his work not necessarily him as a communicator even though he is like a storyteller um but he would be someone that I would look to as far as in the business or marketplace world that's like has the has more than just here's the same old information about speaking or about what I'm trying to communicate. So I would love to hear the story of the journey of your call into ministry. Yeah, so I wanted to be an architect growing up, um, even though I'm terrible at drawing, but um, it seemed like something that was interesting. I grew up a pastor's son, so. I was around a lot of ministry things. I loved ministry, but didn't feel like super called towards it. And your dad was um, not just a pastor, but he was, yeah. he's, correct me if I'm wrong, he was a traveling evangelist. Yeah, yeah, so I grew up traveling all over the country and world with him. And, Incredible. Um, so I had a lot of great experiences, like a very positive uh, ministry, like uh, history. But um, that was, I was on a mission trip uh, to Mexico, and I just, as, 
as weird as it sounds, I've just felt the Lord say, like, this is what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand at the time. Uh, and I didn't even have a grid for <laughs> hearing from the Lord at the time. Sure. You know? But um, I just, over the next, like, three or four years towards the end of high school, just felt like the things that I uh, enjoyed began to shift. And um, and then I got to, went to North Greenville, and, and God kind of continued to refine that call. And then after after North Greenville, I've, been, I've worked at several different churches doing, you know, internships and stuff like that. And, um, and then I was, you know, working through after seminary of like, okay, well, what does like, what is my passion wheel? Like, where is that big piece on it? And I've always felt like church planning, even in college was like where I was going to end up. But I was always feeling like, yeah, that's great, but I'm too young to do that, mm. you know? And, um, so then we just kind of walk, began walking through a couple doors that would have been like dream jobs of stuff I would said, man, like that would have paid a lot better than church planning did, and that would have offered a lot larger platform. And every time we'd leave the interview, me and Lauren would look at each other and be like, we will know what it is, but that's not what we're meant to do. Mm -hmm. And so then we finally agreed to go to a church planning assessment so that we could tell God, okay, well, we walked through the door. Now let us do something else. And... Um, and then when we went to the church playing assessment, as soon as we left, we knew that that was what we were meant to do. And the people that were doing the assessment said, we don't think your age is a bad thing. We actually think it's a good thing. Um, wow. So, yeah. So here we are in Greenville, greatest city in the world. What have been the things that your mentors have taught you and who are those mentors? Yeah. So I, who I would refer to as like my spiritual grandfather um, was a guy named, uh, well, he's still, he's still with us, Dr. Pinnell. He was um, a VP at North Greenville, and uh, he was one of the only people that would actually, like, personally invest time in me that was working at the institution at the time. Mm -hmm. And he would meet with me every other Saturday morning um, for breakfast, and he would just pour into me and allow his wisdom and experience to just be something that I got. I just ate it up. Recently, like... Uh, Lee McDermott has been a huge Im impact. I, th I think he's going to be on one of these at some point, but um, he's just kind of one of the most um, Holy Spirit aware people that I've met in a really long time. Of He can sense what the Holy Spirit's doing in my life mm. just from even not even being around me at times. Some days I'll be having a difficult day, and literally you can go back and look at my phone, and that day I've gotten a text from Lee. Just out of the blue, you know, right? The yeah. Holy Spirit said, "Hey, you need to reach out to Mitch." So good. Um, but yeah, I have I've had a lot of people that have been part of the part of my spiritual journey, you know, that um, that I point to. But though Dr. Pan would probably be one of those earliest ones, besides my dad, and uh, and Lee would be uh, would be one of my most recent ones. Do you have any crazy stories to tell? Anything that's like. Man, you're not going to believe this, but this is a true story. You've got to hear this. Man, um, as I think about, like, even our space in Greenville of um, all the all the different things. But just to, to share one, I guess there's so many that I could pull from. But when we were originally looking at a space, we, we wanted a space so that we could have our small groups meet on site throughout the week. And that was a problem because the area we wanted to be in, everything was about 15 to $25 a square foot, which is expensive. The Woodruff Road area is the number one retail corridor in the south. And um, so we're looking around, and 15 $25 a square foot is just not doable for a church plant. And so we found this building right off Woodruff Road. And the only way I can describe it is God had already showed me this space. But I walked through a door, and it was it's in the back of our it's in the back of our building, um, actually where one of the studios is, and I felt like the Lord was like, "This was the place I showed you." Mm -hmm. And so I looked at the realtor. It was it was cheaper, but it still wasn't in our price range. Um, and I looked at the realtor. I was like, "This is the space God has for us, but we can't afford this." And he's like, "We'll make an offer." And I was like. Yeah, but like, no, this is going to be an insulting offer. He's like, well, this, the man who owns this is like a, a strong believer and you never know. And I was like, all right, well, tell him we're not trying to like, you know, downgrade his space by saying this. It's just all we have. When I got the call back from the realtor, um, he said, Mitch, I hope you're sitting down. I was like, okay. He's like, we have a deal. And he, he looked at me and he said, hey, this wow. is a com commercial real estate agent. He looked wow. at me and he said, 
I've worked in real estate for a long time. He's like, you can't get space in the middle of nowhere, Packlet, South Carolina for this. So we are wow. in one of the most prime locations in all of the South for under $4 a square foot. That's incredible, man. So it's like, it's it was one of those things That's where it's awesome. like, there's no way that that happens unless God's not like, hey, this is the exact building. Right. You know, and that, that the owner of the building sat in our first service and the entire service just we wept because he got to be part of a church being in his building. Tell me about the greatest church member you've ever known. Oh, man. Um, so it would be a guy named Steve uh, at my home church. I don't know if I'm allowed to give his last yeah. name, but Steve. I mean, why not? Yeah, it's Steve Parker is, uh, is a member at, at uh, Bowling Springs First, and he is the single most generous person I've ever come in contact with. And um, he is he does great in his business, and I really do believe it's directly uh, related to the fact of God knows, hey, he can trust him with a little bit, so he can trust him with a lot. And he, I can't tell you the number of times of, and he, he would hate me for saying this because he's someone that doesn't want recognition, but um, he literally painted our entire building for free. Wow. Um, wow. And has given me and Lauren, you know, time and time again, I mean, within the last month, he just randomly gave us $500. I mean, just constantly living in a generous way, not just with me, but with everyone around him. So from a, from representing the king with how he stewards people and resources, it would be him. What are the things that you would like to see church members do more? And what are the things that you would like to see church members do less? Man, what that that's a great question. So I'm gonna that's a beach ball. So here yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would love to see church members um, live in the reality that the person that's on stage is part of the flock. Right? That yes, they are under shepherds, but we are not the Messiah. You know, and I think living with that expectation would allow the people on stages and on platforms to be able to be open and honest without having to feel like, okay, well, if I share this with this person, then all of a sudden they're, they're going to not want to be a part of what I'm doing. So I think living in recognition that none of us are King Jesus. We're all meant to be like him, but none of us are King Jesus. And so I shouldn't build a golden calf here by, by expecting or pretending that my pastor is perfect, but instead give them space to be vulnerable without like saying, okay, well now I gotta find a new church because I found out my, my pastor struggles with his mental health. Uh, I've been blown away by the mm. people that have walked well, away from our church plant by me simply opening up about my journey with mental health and depression. Mm. Because I no longer fit in what they expected from a pastor, like a pastor is someone that doesn't mess up like I do. Right. Doesn't have the same problems. So that would be the biggest thing is that for the the expectation not to be that this is a golden calf that we're going to worship, but instead, no, this is a broken person that's simply sheep feeding sheep, mm -hmm. you know. What is right now um, pretty hard and difficult that others wouldn't assume or guess? I think that, um, I'd say there's probably two for me. Um, I think one would be uh, how lonely it can be um, at times, like leading something that's new, you know, when when there's when you're in an established world, not that there's there's different difficulties, but there's a certain level of like you feel like there's like okay these people are going to be here no matter what you know what I mean if for nothing else they right. get a paycheck to be here, and I think that sometimes the when you have in a church plant saying where everyone's volunteer that it's a lot easier for people to move in and out of your life, mm. and so it can be very lonely if someone that you trust and that you like invest in and pour into, and then the next month they're gone you know I think that's yeah. I think that's really difficult and on as far as on a craft side of things um, I think what people don't understand is um, I really put a lot of time and effort into making uh, the way that I teach and preach more than a formula you know more than just hey here let me get up here and give this presentation I want it to be where you know one of the things I'm caught I feel the Lord specific call me to do was paint the Bible so in order to paint, you have to go through a certain level in which you resonate and feel the text and make the text come alive more than just information dissemination. And so many people, because it doesn't sound like information dissemination, assume that it's not scripturally sound. Mm. 
Mm. It's because I'm not saying this commentary, this commentary, this commentator, commentary, this what this word means. But instead, because I'm telling it as a story, a lot of mm. people don't take into account how much time I've put in to make this story a accurate to the text right mm -hmm. in context but then accurate and applicable to the shoes that they're walking in tell me about the relationship of the teaching pastor and the worship pastor and what that should look like yeah i i i am a very much i believe i not to discount right and some people are going to hear this and be like oh he doesn't think the teaching preaching god's word is important that's not what i'm saying here what i'm saying is this is that melody has a way of catalyzing and sealing something in, encapsulating totally agree. a story or a experience or even a word from the Bible or the Holy Spirit in a much more powerful way than I could ever say in one message. So what I what I like to think of is like the worship is not the build up and cool down. I would say I've seen even our people and in when when creativity and art is valued as from God not as simply, oh, well, this is part of this, but preaching's really where God speaks. It's like, no, he speaks to us through everything. But when that worship mm -hmm. and that singing and that um, giving people that, that mode to remember something, when that's really valued, I see people respond to that more than even teaching and preaching because it's something that then will stick with them more than just, hey, here's a tweetable quote from Pastor Mitch. Mm -hmm. you know, so I view it as like we are both priests up there, right? We're both doing something that is uh, the same thing just in a different form. It's not let, okay, well, you do good job because I'm about to come up and do what's the most important part of the service. Mm -hmm. And that may be a hot take. I, I don't think it should be, right? If you look at, at the Old Testament corporate singing and worship of God's people, I, you know, I think it was valued as much or more, and it was a way of even communicating stories, right? That's why they would have all these all these songs that were stories, because it's easier to remember a song than a sentence, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a, me a melody wrapped in a memory is so much more powerful than a memory by itself. Tell me why you love your church. I love that, you know, and I would say this is like the bedrock of everything we do, it permeates through this layer, is that uh, people are the goal, not the means. Um, and a lot of, even, and this is sad, but in church environments, I've found that people, whether staff or attendees, are a means to get something that we want or something that the church needs. And we, we cover it in something beautiful like vision or here's our next five-year plan. But it oftentimes is uh, at the cost of our people or our staff. So what I love about uh, The Fold is that because that's been such a... Uh, such a like fire log on the fire so early on I feel like we've been doing a very healthy job of what's this look like if people are the goal mm -hmm. not simply accomplishing a vision um, that we want to do what do you love about your wife's role in your mm -hmm. ministry yeah oh, man she is uh, yeah I, I don't want to use too many like cliches here so I'll try to give something that's nuanced um, my wife is the breadwinner for us which I I love, but I tease people all the time that I'm a trophy husband. Um, but she's, well, you're a church planner. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, so but good. she is a she is a uh, full time wedding photographer, and she is insanely gifted at that. Mm -hmm. And I love uh, what I love about her role is that, um, and part of this is like when you start something, you kind of get to say what it looks like. <laughs> uh, is that she? There's not an expectation that she is this you know, first lady or she has to be this certain person. Like she can just be there and be part of it and do and be, she's heavily involved. She runs a lot of our social media and stuff like that, but where she can be there without and be an actual person in the church without having to feel all this weight and pressure of, well, now she's got to be the holiest woman in this building in order for her to be a valid person. Are our seminaries more helpful or harmful? Ooh. I'll say this from my experience, right? And mine is a very specific subset, right? Of, you know, I went from North Greenville to Southeastern. What I think is harmful about um, our seminaries right now, and I think it's actually taken place in not just seminaries, but pretty much academia in general, is that the purpose of seminary originally was to refine right. and critique That's right. critical thinking. 
And what we've moved away from is critical thinking. Is now it's tribal language and here's why those people that disagree with us are idiots. Mm -hmm. And so I, this was my experience at, at Southeastern. So I'll go on record here, right? Um, I was, I, if I could do it again, I would not, I wouldn't go that route. Because you wouldn't go the seminary route or you wouldn't go to that. I wouldn't seminary go that seminary. Route. I needed to be challenged in critical thinking. I didn't need people giving more me more mantra based stuff. I needed people that were actually like, hey, here's what th they believe. These people aren't idiots, right, for believing this. How do they get there? Instead of you giving me these red herring type arguments where like, look how ridiculous this is. When in reality, as I started studying on my own, I was like, wow, you've totally missed the entire boat on that person's argument because mm. you're just trying to figure out a way how they're wrong and you're right. Mm. So I would say, and I can just speak from my experience, is that it was less about critical thinking and more about figuring out whose side you're on and then let's light the torches and fight them. Mm. And I would say if they continue wow. to operate in that vehicle, they will hurt us more than help us. And the next generation is going to look at it and say, yeah, okay, I can go pick up any Gruden book and read exactly what you want me to hear. Mm -hmm. I, don't need, I don't need to go there and get indoctrinated for three years and pay money and do all this. I can, I can get that because you're not saying anything new. You're just constantly regurgitating. And then, I mean, because I would say things in class that were for the purpose of critical thinking. And all that was met with was, let's shut that down. Let's write you off. Okay, is, you know, is Mitch... Is Mitch turning liberal or is he... No, I was just thinking through things. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. which was the purpose of seminary. <laughs> yeah. How should Christians treat politics? Uh, so I am not a very political person and that's not like a stance. I just, there's so much going on in my life right now. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting to, to, to hear people argue. Have you ever been a political person? Uh, no, I've I've been I've norm, I'm a very like driven person. So anything that seems like we're, I'm just gonna have to like fight and argue with people about stuff, I'm just normally like run from and do my own thing. I think a Christian should approach politics this way: is that there are other shoes in the room that have different experiences and different life, um, you know, um, opportunities available. So. If I were to be Jesus in this moment, which is what we're called to be, is that I would meet, as Nowen said, I would meet them with hospitality, not hostility. So I think wherever someone falls politically, and I, I, I think that you know everybody wants to, everybody wants to believe Jesus is on their side, which I don't know that he would be involved in any of our politics here because he wasn't very much involved in in Roman politics. Um, but you know, I think I think the key is, you know, I do. I am I am someone that's pro-life, but I'm also pro-life beyond just the womb. I think it's somewhere we've got to care for people at every point and stage. But um, you know, I, it's one of those things where I tell people is like, you've got to you've got to leave space within your circle where people can disagree with you politically. Otherwise, you're going to have a very narrow and closed-minded circle. What are your thoughts on pastors' mental health and wellness? Man, yeah, I'm so passionate about this. I felt so much fear and condemnation about talking about my journey with depression and mental health um, that I've been walking through for about five to seven years now. Um, and it, what's been hard for me is like a lot of these champions that like carried the baton before me, like um, Jared Wilson and, um, and losing Darren Patrick just recently. It, it, it takes a toll. What it, what it does is it's the enemy that speaks and says, you can't walk in that because um, just because you walk in that doesn't mean healing will be found there. And what I've found is like for my mental health, though, I, it's not that it's a one-time snap, here's healing, is that the more I talk about it, it no longer has the same bondage over me. Mm -hmm. So I think for pastors is, um, a, we've got to get past the general divide that says everything mental health is you could just fix yourself if you tried harder. That is Pray, scientific. Read your Bible. Yeah, it's scientifically just it's not true. Um, but we've got to get past that gen generational gap there. And um, also, I think um, giving people space to to like we talked about earlier of being able to be vulnerable and without being written off. You know, I, I love what one pastor said recently is that. And this is not normally a pastor that I agree with on a lot of stuff, but he said, you know, we as evangelicals suck at grace. He said, wow. 
he said, it's a good thing that Paul wasn't an evangelical because he would have never been the leader of the New Testament church. Wow. And he said, it's a good thing Peter was not an evangelical because he would have never made it to Pentecost. Mm. Which I think is so true. Is like, mm. the we, we, we expect pastors to be the ones that bear the good news of grace, but we don't allow them that grace. It's something that we're working towards in it, and, and when we have that, and we're in the process of working to get that full-time on-site counselor, um, is that will be something that will be mandatory for staff. If for nothing else, it's mandatory to take them off the hook of the stigma that comes with counseling. Mm. I'm like, well, then you can just blame it. Well, my pastor makes me go to counseling every yeah, so often. Yeah, they can throw like, you under That's the bus. great. I'm great with that. If it yeah, means you being healthy and whole, then, then let's take that, you know, so you don't have to tell your wife, well, why is your pastor making you go to counseling? It's like, no, you can be like, well, it's I, everyone has to do it, you know. So it will be something that will be mandatory because of the role it's played in my life. And there was so much that stigma that kept me from it. Um, and, and I, you know, I think in part, you know, generationally, you even look at like New Testament, at the Old Testament with this is like different generations have different battles to fight. Mm -hmm. I think my battle was to fight the stigma. And I think the next generation is going to be, okay, well, what's it look like for us now? Now that the stigma is different, how do we allow ourselves to lean in even further? So mm -hmm. I think that's been the, the battle that I've been fighting. And I think that hopefully it'll be a different battle for the next generation when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Who is one of the thought leaders that everybody needs to start paying attention to in your head? Um, it, religiously or... Could be either. Uh, I love... There's a guy named Greg McCown who wrote a book called Essentialism. And Greg is kind of one of the up-and-comers, I think, when it comes to... Um, he says a lot of things that are in some way you've heard before, but he packages it in a way that's like super, super uh, carryable, where you can take it and then carry it with you. Um, Greg McCown be one in the religious world. Man, John Mark Comer, I think, is like going to be a, vo a transcendent voice for a long time. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I love Elon Musk. I think that a lot of this stuff is crazy, and a lot of people love to write off crazy, but I right. tend to like run towards crazy. And that's to me is like if it's something that stimulates me, mm. a thought. And you know, I think that that's what's so. I think that's what we've kind of because of how tribal our like specifically our Christian subculture is we've like yeah. not even listened to people that are weird and different I think that's what was so I think it's kind of what led to where Rob Bell and the church ended up is like mm. we missed the interesting things that he was saying because we didn't agree with a lot of what he was saying mm. and I'm that's why I look around and be like we don't like Rob Bell, right? Everybody hates Rob Bell but like we quote Lewis all the time right. and I'm like they're not that different like if you actually read their stuff but i think in order mm. for that for that next generation the church is going to have to get beyond okay well we can't listen to this, this person unless we agree with everything they said or unless ed stetzer writes an article that says this guy is okay for you to listen to you know we have to get beyond that where we allow those multiple streams to kind of like flow into ours mm. um you know so embrace the weird it's good. <laughs> so this has been awesome, Mitch. This yeah, has been so great. Fun. Um, this is the final question that I want to ask you. Okay. What do you want to be most remembered for? Man, I want to be most remembered as someone that was um, absolutely recklessly generous to everyone around him. Mm. Um, I want, you know, craft-wise, like I want people to, to look back and say he painted the Bible in a way that was beautiful and artistic in the way that I taught. Um, as far as relationally, I want people to be able to say Mitch was someone that was always teachable and always reachable. Like he was never at a place where I didn't feel like he was still there for me. Um, so I've kind of got things on different levels of like, what would I like for every the world to say about me is that I was a gen like recklessly generous towards people. Um, what do I want people that observe what I do for a living, I want them to say, wow, he made the Bible come to life by how he painted it. And I want the people around me to say that I was always there for them and always teachable and wanting to learn and listen. Mitch, thanks a bunch, man. Dude, this was fun. I